So let me start by introducing myself. I'm Freddy Cachasso. Um, I work here. I'm a researcher here at Perimeter Institute. And this week, well, or these four days, so this was a short week, uh, but we will find a way to make up for it. Uh, don't worry about that. Uh, <laughs> so um, this week, the idea is to discuss quantum field theory. Everything there is to know in four lectures. <laughs> <laughs> well, quantum field theory is zero. Actually, I want to give a, a different name to this. Perhaps My friends in Quantum Foundations will completely kill me for this, because this has a completely different meaning. Well, not completely different, but a more rigorous meaning. But I decided to give a different name from the standard one, because we're going to basically start from a very different place from any book that starts quantum field theory. And why are we doing this if you have a quantum field theory course later on? Well, basically, this week is as some sort of warm up, okay, for what's coming next week, which are your first two core courses, okay, relativity and quantum mechanics. Now, the reason I want to start from a very different place than the usual books is something that happened last year. In the summer, something spectacular happened. Does anybody know what happened? Excellent. The Higgs was discovered. So that's a big triumph for humankind, right? I mean, this is something incredibly spectacular that something, a set of equations so simple as a standard model, well, at first, they don't look that simple, <laughs> okay? But if you think about it, it's something completely spectacular. We human beings, we can write down something that describes nature to incredibly short distances. And everything seems to work perfectly okay. Hundreds and hundreds of experiments carried out, thousands, well, hundreds of thousands of measurements, and everything fits perfectly. So where are the measurements we do? So that's why I decided to start with collider experiments. In particular, we can keep in mind the large Hadron Collider. Which was the start of the show last year with the discovery of the Higgs. Okay, so what do we do in collider experiments? Well, we usually have two beams of particles and we make them collide. So that sounds very easy. So let me represent one of the beams so we have a bunch of particles. Of course, this doesn't look very nice. So people like to draw this as if it was a cylinder, an imaginary cylinder containing the particles that we're going to scatter. They are moving with some velocity. And in some frame, we can think about another bunch of particles as particles that are at rest, okay? So these ones would be our target. And these are somehow our projectiles, okay? So we're going to throw all these particles and make them collide with all these particles that are sitting here, okay? I had a hard time deciding how to call these things. So how to say, well, the target should be T and the projectiles P or... So in the end, I couldn't come up with a nice notation for that. So I'm, we're just gonna call the particles here, particles A and particles B, okay? For the lack of a better name, that's what I'm gonna do. Of course, in different frames, we can think about the two groups of particles as moving and colliding, 
Okay. So for particles that are in the set B, we have some density of particles, rho B. Our bunch of particles, let's say it has length B, and the same thing for particles of type A. OK? Very good. So what happens? We're going to make these things collide. I'll also assume that these bunches of particles have an area A. OK? Somehow we make these cylinders of particles, full of particles, and make them collide. How many particles per cylinder we typically have? Well, I don't know in general, but I know I check in Google, and the LHC has per cylinder, if you wish, 100 billion protons. Okay? So we're talking about two bunches of 100 billion protons coming together, colliding, and doing stuff. Okay? In fact, the LHC scatters 3,000 bunches of this sort every time against each other, OK? Now, these particles come, or these bunches of particles come. They mix with each other. And particles come out flying. OK? They are the result of one particle from A and one particle from B colliding, okay? but we have tons of them. So we have a lot of statistics, right? because we have billions of particles colliding. Now, what are we interested in? Well, our detectors will tell us the kind of events that happen. Okay? So we're interested in understanding the number of events of a given kind. Now, what could this dependence, the dependence of the number of events of a given kind, on the parameters we have on the top blackboard could be? What do you think? So that's the object we want to compute. But we want to somehow strip out all the information that comes from the actual experiment we're doing. Say, the kind of collider experiment we're performing, the size of the object, and so on. So we have to strip out all that information. In order to do it, and to get something that is more intrinsic to the actual physics that is happening, particle per particle, we have to find out how this thing depends on all the parameters of our collider. OK? So how does this depend on, say, the area of the bunches? Should be proportional. Excellent. How about on the other parameters? That's right. It should be proportional to the density of the particles in the target, proportional to the density of the particles that are approaching, the length of the beams. OK? That's pretty good. Sorry? That's right. That's right. So that information is here, and we're going to write it like that. Yes, we're going to have the area squared. That's going to appear. But the number of particles, so let's actually write it here. The number of particles in the target is equal to what? And the number of particles that are approaching, that's right. So in terms of this, the same formula can be written as oh, you're happier. Excellent. <laughs> well, actually, this is the formula I was going to write next. So that was very good. But so all the physics 
that we want to extract out of this is in whatever we have to write here. So if this is dimensionless, what should be the dimension of the thing I'm going to write here? Well, it's trivial now from this, from this formula, right? What should it be? Dimensions of area, yeah. And it's usually denoted as sigma. So this object has dimensions of area. And this has special units in particle physics. You can also try to Google to find in the internet why this is called a barn. Okay, I think there are several funny stories about this. But it happens to be one 10 to the minus 24 centimeters square. Okay? Okay, if you find a funny story about why is it called barn, you can tell us tomorrow. Okay, that's pretty good. So this is a formula we want. Yes? Yeah, all that dependence will go in here. Yeah. Well, this is the this is the total number of events in this experiment that I'm carrying out. Yep, these things are these bunches of particles. These are not happening all the time. Not even at the LHC. The LHC produces bunches of particles. Then they go around the tunnel, collide. And then they inject more, and then they inject more, okay? Very good. Yeah, at some point, I, I should have started using the preset. You know? Okay. Very good. So... Before the LHC, there was another collider, actually in the same tunnel, called LEP. This is a large electron positron collider. So does anybody know what a positron is? It's the antiparticle of the electron. Very good. So we know what it's called, right? So there is a particle called the antiparticle of the electron. That's pretty cool, and you can use it in parties when you go and tell your friends. <laughs> but probably not in this course, but in today's tutorial, you will learn what, <laughs> what the positron is, okay? But for the time being, let's just say that the electron is usually denoted as E minus, and the positron is usually denoted as E plus. So lab, from left, we could compute the cross-section. So, of course, if it's called a large electron-positron collider, it's because we are colliding in one bunch of particles are electrons and the other bunch are positrons. The LHC collides protons and protons, okay? So this cross-section of taking... Oh, I didn't write it. That somebody said it, right? This is called the cross-section. So at lab, people measure the cross-section of E plus, E minus going to, say, mu plus, mu minus. What is mu? Does anybody know? The muons? That's right. These are muons. They also measure the cross-section of, of E plus, E minus going, say, to mu plus, mu minus, and gamma. What is gamma? It's a photon. That's how we denote photons. But they also measure the cross-section of this happening. Of producing a mu plus, mu minus, and two gammas. And you can guess what happens next. You can also measure the cross-section of producing two muons and three gammas and so on. Many other things can happen. You can measure the cross-section of this going to taus, to towns. And of course, you can also measure 
last but not least, the cross section of producing again E plus and E minus. Okay? So all this is happening, and all these numbers can be measured. Now, our job as theorists is to find a theory that computes them and predicts them. So that sounds easy. Okay? At least we didn't have to build the accelerate. Yes? How can you determine if what you're measuring, for example, for the process of having one photon differs from the one two photon? Yes. So, of course, if the two photons, that's a very good question, if the two photons are very, very collinear to each other, meaning their momenta are very parallel to each other, it's impossible to distinguish them. Very, very hard to distinguish them. Here, what I mean then is when hap what happens when the photons are in different directions. Okay? They come out in different directions. But that's a very good question because just the cross section, as I'm giving you, uh, doesn't really do justice to what the detectors can do. Detectors not only can measure what kind of events we get out, but they also measure the momentum of the particles coming out. Okay? And nowhere here I told you anything about the momentum of the particles. So there must be a more refined observable that knows about the momentum of the external particles. Yes? So how do detectors tell which particle is based on the mass density? Yeah, so the detectors will have, will have different, different tricks to tell particles apart. So they will have different materials that can absorb very easily different kinds of particles. They will have magnetic fields that can deflect particles to tell their charges. They will have tons of tricks. But I'm happy I don't have to know them. <laughs> yes? That's not an exhaustive list, but shouldn't the first thing that happened be E minus E plus the source would be gamma and not the other? Well, this is not a, as you said, this is not an exhaustive list. Yes. So we can have tons of things. Actually, measuring, yes. It's much easier, I think, to measure things like this. Well, it depends on, on what you want to do. So you design your detector so that you measure, is, is optimized to measure a particular thing. Okay? Very good. So, let's see. As we said, we want to have something that does more justice to the detectors. So you can also find in the internet, I encourage you to search for ATLAS and CMS. These are the two main detectors at the LHC, okay? And I study very carefully how they work. And then come back and explain it to us. Uh, so, as I said, not only they can measure which particles come out, but they can also measure their momentum. Okay? So if they measure the moment of the outgoing particles, we can try to define an observable that depends on that. We can try to count how many particles were produced of a given kind in a given region in momentum space or in the phase space, what is called the phase space of the external particles. So the space of all possible momentum configurations of outgoing particles is called the phase space. Okay? Now our job right now is to find how to determine an infinitesimal volume of that phase space, okay? Because we want to define an observable that depends on how, or counts how many particles are measured in an infinitesimal volume in phase space, okay? So that's what we want to do. So for each of the external particles, as I said, I couldn't find a good notation now, even for the external particles. So say that external, sorry, outgoing particles
will have momenta denoted as P1, P2, and we will allow any number of them. Okay? So whenever you see numbers 1, 2 through n, at least today, that would mean that these are outgoing particles. Yes? So this, this uh, namespace takes the slightly different from what's in the current case, so it's in the top hand. Is that also includes the position of the particle? That's true. Yes. Okay. So we're going to define it actually. Yes. So we have outgoing particles. Okay, they have this momenta. Their momenta is described by four vectors, of course. Now, what is the space of all possible configurations of momenta for n particles? What would you say? So those who are mathematically inclined, what kind of manifold would that be? Or which manifold would that be? So our first approximation could be that our phase space must be perhaps, okay, or naively, looks like R for N, okay? But that's nonsense, of course, right? Okay, so if you're, if you're really, if you're really, if you're really picky, it should be R n comma three n. <laughs> yes, it's one per particle. Yes. Okay, but that's even even the next one is nonsense. Yes. Can you not have like uh, just like n three n and then plot uh, it for each of the n particles along one axis? I mean, like the key component x y z. Yes. Sorry, I, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just telling you. If I didn't know anything else, the space of all possible values of these objects happens to be there, right? But we know better, right? We know these are particles, right? If they are particles, well, we haven't defined what a particle is, by the way, right? But we will. So. For the time being, let's use our intuitive notion of what a particle is. And we all know that the most fundamental thing that we assign to a particle is its mass, right? So if these are particles, they all come with a mass. So are we allowed to have any values of the momentum? No, so you're saying no, so why? Very good. So if these are physical particles, they have to satisfy the following equation. So P for particle I, okay? So that's my notation for the ith particle. The norm of this vector has to be equal to the mass of the vector square, okay? And this is called the on-shell condition, okay? So we are working, or we're going to be working on, I'm giving the lecture, so I choose <laughs> to work with a metric that is mostly minus, okay? So in this, with using this Minkowski metric, pi square happens to be, I mean, people usually denote the first component, or we, I mean, as if I didn't. The first component of the vector is going to be the energy. So that's what I mean by the norm square of the vector. OK, pretty good. So why is this thing called on-shell? What do I mean by that? Well, in the meantime, let me also ask you something else. So is the mass a Lorentz invariant? Yes, people say yes. Excellent. Yeah, so here, 
course, when we are in high school, sometimes people tell us that the mass can change and this and that, but we're not in high school anymore. So we know that when people talk about the mass, we only talk about the rest mass, and this is a Lorentz invariant, okay? Because it's defined as the norm of this vector, in fact. So it's, it's a Lorentz invariant. Is there any other Lorentz invariant that we can construct for each particle? Yeah, but out of the things that I have here, so we said that Lorentz invariants Yes, but for just for one particle. So we said that the mass is a Lorentz invariant. But there is another one that is really tricky. It's also hidden in the in the momentum of the of the particle. It's actually the sign of the zeroth component of the ith, of the momentum of the ith particle. We are Well, why is this Lorentz invariant? Does it mean that you use the metric? Or is it no, it doesn't matter. Does it, it, yeah. if I change just the sign to the minus one of zero, it's also Lorentz invariant? Well, no, but, uh, but it's a sign of the component. Uh, right. this, is, this is different from the sign of that component, right? Yes. So why is this true? Well, to understand that, let's actually draw what we mean by something being on shell, OK? So. It's convenient to consider the case when the mass is zero. So if the mass is zero, we can draw in momentum space we can actually draw a con okay. This is in momentum space. And a particle that has mass zero, its momentum should be constrained to lie on the shell defined by the surface of the cone. Yes? What is the P? Oh, so there is a three momentum, right? So we have, we have the vector P, which is defined as Px, Py, Pz. And that's the norm, yes? Very good. It's only invariant under, yeah, un only under the connected component of the Lorentz group. Yes. Okay. So particles with mass will then be restricted to lie on hyperbolas. So the momentum has to lie somewhere here. Okay. Now the sign of the zeroth component tells us whether you are future directed or past directed, okay? Of course, if we have a particle, not that we have, but suppose that we had a particle whose momentum could be outside of the light cone here, of this null cone, then its zeroth component would not be Lorentz invariant, the sign would not be Lorentz invariant, because a Lorentz transformation could move you up and down. Lorentz transformations cannot map a point that is inside the null cone to a point that is outside. In particular, it cannot map a point that is pointing in this direction to a point that is pointing in this direction, to a vector that is pointing in this direction. And that's the reason the sign tells you if you are on the top half or on the bottom half, a Lorentz transformations will not be able to map you from one to the other. So that's why it's Lorentz invariant for physical particles, okay? Not for unphysical particles. How can we call do you know how it's called a particle that whose momentum is somewhere here? People, people have given a name for such a weird thing. It's what? Attacking. Yeah, that's right. But that's not important for us because. Yeah. Okay. So we're ready for our second approximation to the phase space. Okay. So we want to define the volume of an infinitesimal region in phase space. 
if this was a phase space, the infinitesimal volume element would be just this, right? But we know it's wrong, so we have to fix it. So knowing this, we should impose, I'm not going to try to describe what the phase space is as a whole, because it's a very complicated manifold. It's a sub-manifold of this one, and it's a very curved manifold. Instead, I'm going to try and modify the infinitesimal volume correctly to get something that is correct. So the infinitesimal volume, or our second approximation, so this was our first approximation, our second approximation is that it should be the product of all these particles constrained to have their momentum on the mass shell. Okay? But these are outgoing particles, so I want everybody to be outgoing. So I'm actually going to put here something that constrains the sign of the zeroth component, where this is defined to be 1 if x is greater than 0, and 0 if x is less than 0. OK? What do you think? Are we done? This looks quite reasonable. Do you think that that's the whole space available for us? Remember, that's what we are trying to, to describe. The, all the space that is available for our external particles to go into. Excellent, very good. Imagine that our, inter, our initial particles, the sum of their momenta is square, is some given quantity. Okay? Well, can we access the whole space of external mom of, of outgoing particles? No. We have to preserve momentum. We have to impose momentum conservation. So our final approximation, which is approximation three, is that the volume of the phase space is corrected by simply asking the momenta to satisfy momentum conservation. So the sum of the momenta of, the, of all the external particles must equal the sum of our incoming particles. And now we got it. Okay? So that's the space available for us. And we want to ask, is this going to work? And we want to ask, what's the probability, or how many events happen to lie on a given differential of the volume of the phase space? Okay. Now, this quantity here has a name. It's called the differential of the Lorentz invariant phase space. Okay. So you will hear people talking about the D-lips. Yeah, you know. OK. So now we are ready to define the object we want to study, which is called the differential Cross section. Yes? So we're assuming that the momenta of all the incoming particles in the two bunches are identical. Yes. That is what we're doing. That's right. Very good. Thank you. Yes. So we're assuming that, well, just from the picture, right, the target, say, is not that they are at rest. And the ones that are incoming, they are all, that bunch is incoming with some velocity. And then that means that, yeah, said another way, we're also assuming that all the particles in that bunch and all the particles in this, in this bunch are of the same kind. 
okay? We're not mixing electrons with protons. We're only throwing electrons against positrons or throwing pro protons against protons, okay? That's a good question. So we're going to define the differential cross-section, okay? Just as we did there, but now with our D-lips, now it's a differential cross-section for particles A and B going to some external state whose Lorentz invariant phase space element is defined in this way, okay? And of course, we need something here. How do we know that we need something here? There are two reasons. We are still missing something in this formula. Yeah, first of all, dimensions. Second, this thing, by, according to its name, is a Lorentz invariant. And this is an area. So this is wrong at the moment. Not only that, this object is only, only knows about the kinematics of the process, and it doesn't know anything else. So this cannot be the full answer. So let's fix one problem first, okay? Let's fix the problem of the fact that this is not Lorentz invariant and this is Lorentz invariant. So the problem is gonna be fixed by, yeah, actually, mm. yes. You say it's Lorentz invariant. Uh, I see why the Angel constraint and the Lang constraint are Lorentz invariant itself, but the delta of the photon moment is also Lorentz invariant. Yes, so imagine you perform a Lorentz transformation on a delta function of that sort, right? Then an exercise for all of you, which you should try, is that in order to remove, to undo the Lorentz transformation, the only price you pay is the determinant of the transformation you perform, okay? And the determinant happens to be one because the Lorentz group is SO3,1, which you all know from Anna's course. I think. <laughs> if not, well, doesn't matter. Tomorrow we will discuss something. Okay, so we have to fix this. It turns out that the object that we have that we want to put in here, after all, we took in, we took into account the phase space of the of the outgoing particles. So the object we're going to put here is something. The numbers are conventions. But this is something that depends only on the incoming particles or the particles we're going to scatter, okay? They are the energy of the incoming particles, the product of the energies times the magnitude of the relative velocity, okay? So now an exercise for you is to show that this object has the same Lorentz transformations as as an area, okay? So check Lorentz transformations. So if this takes in, into account the Lorentz transformations, what we're left with is something that is Lorentz invariant. So this D is Lorentz invariant. And it contains all the information of the dynamics. That's why I call it D, okay? Everything else is just kinematics. So all that has to do with the physics of what's going on in the interaction has to be contained in our object D. And that's what we're going to study for the rest of today and most likely in the remaining of the lectures. Okay. Now, we have seen that we produce scattering the same particles, we can produce many different things, okay? So that tells us that whatever is governing the physics of these interactions must be probabilistic in nature, okay? Yes? So you could be only one of the bottom, just a different direction, on the 
No, 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 the factors, are the num yeah, very good, sorry. The, 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 num the numerical factors. Yeah, so the claim, what you want to check, or what I want you to check, is that the product of the energies times V compensate the Lorentz transformations of the left-hand side, okay? So that should be a fun exercise. Um, right. So I was saying that in order to compute D, It's where all the dynamics and all the physics will enter, right? So in order to do that, we have to take a small detour So, but before we attempt to do that, let's take a small detour and review some features of quantum mechanics. Okay. Yes. So, D is a dimensionless constant here, and why do we use it? No, it's not dimensionless. Well, just to determine the dimensions, just look at the, you should, you should look at the dimension of the d lips. okay? That's an exercise. For any number of particles, try to determine what the dimensions of every factor here is, okay? Just look at the d lips definition. Okay, so let's do some quantum mechanics. Very, very basic quantum mechanics we're gonna do because you're gonna have a course on that. Yes. I'm sorry, what did Dirk have this thing to do? Yeah, I I somehow erased that there, yes. Okay. All right, so what do we want? So in order to describe a quantum mechanical system, we start with a Hilbert space. Okay. And we can have some basis for our Hilbert space. So roughly we can think about this as a vector space and we have a basis of the vector space. Okay, but in principle, we can have different bases. So somebody can choose this, and another observer can choose a different basis. Okay, so these are two different bases. Let me call this B and this B prime. Now, for them to describe the same physical reality, Wigner in the 30s found what the condition had to be, and the condition is basically the following. There is a more refined condition, but we're not going to discuss it in this. We, we only have four lectures after all, actually three and a little bit. So there exists an operator, let's call it U that maps one set to the other set, okay? So if you have a state psi, 
there will be a map to stay psi prime equals to u acting on psi, okay? So, Wigner told us what this operator has to satisfy, and that's what we're going to get. Right now, yes. Yeah, you're right. It's very pedantic to do it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so we're not going to do it. So. Um, pretty good. So, so what happens? So imagine you have a state psi, right? A general state expanded in the basis psi i. Okay? So the physical quantities, and this is a basis that diagonalizes some observable. Okay? So the physical quantities we want to compute are given by the probabilities, say, of finding our state psi with an eigenvalue that corresponds to the state, to the basis psi i, after we perform a measurement, and that number is this, which can be computed from there by assuming that the basis is orthonormal by this quantity. So these probabilities should be Preserve, okay, these are the physical observables. And that means that we will like, when we apply this transformation to our psi prime states, we should get the same answer. But these states are obtained by applying this transformation to the original states. Okay? So before we can learn what U has to do, we should review a little bit of what the adjoint operator is. The adjoint of an operator O is. So if you have an operator O with matrix element given by this, in other words, it's sandwiched between two states. we define the adjoint of this operator to be the following. It's equal to this. Is everybody familiar with this? They're all happy with this. Excellent. Very good. Or, in other words, we could think about this, okay? So if you, think, if you see this, this tells us that we can think about this as the operator acting on this state phi, but the star tells us that we can revert this and think about this as O phi psi, okay? So this is another way of thinking about what the adjoint operator is. And now we can use this definition to apply it here and discover that if we apply that definition here, okay, we can undo this, go back, and write this up psi i, put the i joint of the operator for this half. On this side, we just apply u to psi. And then getting the equality tells us that this product has to be one, okay? Yes? Or times a phase. Times a phase. But then, to understand what the phase has to be, and to understand that this can only can be unitary or anti-unitary, which is the other option, you have to read Wigner's paper, and I encourage you to do that. Um, so, he found that we need this operator to satisfy the following. 
is a unitary operator. Okay. Yes, sorry. Okay, so now we are, we are done with our small detour, and we can go back to scattering physics. Okay, so we're going to have some working assumptions. The first one is that all the physical world, or at least the physical world, world relevant to the scattering process we're going to study, is described by a Hilbert space. Second, the set of all incoming particles of all possible forms, or better said, states, forms a basis. Okay. Now comes the tricky part. How do we even define this? Well. I'm going to define this as follows. I'm going to declare that there is one state that is a vacuum, meaning no particles at all. So that's why I decided to replace particles by states, because you would say, somebody would complain and say, look, you did the vacuum is not, strictly speaking, a particle. The direct sum of this, of the vacuum, with all possible states that represent a single particle, okay? So this is called the set of one particle states. Plus, the set of states that represent two particles. This is what we have been discussing up to now, okay? Our incoming particles are described as just a state in the sector that describes two particles, okay? These are the two incoming particles. But nothing really of what I've discussed depends on the fact that we only scatter two particles. We should be able to describe more particles if we wanted. So we can have three particle states and in fact, we need an infinite number of sectors, okay? So this is one basis of the Hilbert space. We're going to end when we, um, let's see. Yeah, that's right. It's a natural place to start. Um, let's continue here. So here comes something very tricky that in, in different books you will find it described in different ways. But I think, I think this is the next assumption, or what I'm going to tell. Yeah, the next assumption is, is, is the way I would like to phrase it, which is that the same is true for outgoing particles. Okay, so we have only one Hilbert space that des describes all the physical reality, okay? Now, I'm assuming that all the set of incoming po possible incoming particles form a basis of the whole Hilbert space, okay? 
I'm also assuming that there is another basis which is made out of all possible outgoing particles. Okay? So you see the, con the consequence of this, which is easy to state, is very profound. It means that a single state of the outgoing particles can be expressed as a linear combination of the states in the incoming particle basis, right? After all, they are both bases. So to distinguish the bases, I'm going to give a label in to these ones, and to these ones, I'm going to give a label that it says out. Okay. So as I said, in our experiment, in our case, we have some particular external state. Remember, we call them P1 up to Pn. Those are our, our favorite particles in the in the final state. And the fact that these guys form a basis means that this state can be expanded in that basis. Okay. Of some other momenta, let me call them P prime to distinguish them from P. In fact, we have to integrate over the d-lips of the corresponding m-particle states with some coefficients. So let me put the coefficients here that depend. This will depend, of course, on the incoming guys, on, on the choice of the outgoing guys. Let me call them final and incoming in order not to, or initial, in order not to write too many things. Okay? Very good. So whatever we want to compute, this D that we mentioned before, our physical object, must somehow be related to the following, to the overlap of our initial states, PA, PB, and our final states. Okay? So whatever this quantity is, somehow must contain the information we need in order to compute the dynamical quantity that enters in the cross section, which is the thing we measure. Yes? Oh, brilliant. That's right. It means, it means that, well, no, I didn't say that. Sorry. I said these are all possible experiments you can ever perform, right? Which don't necessarily involve only two particles. Right? So the experiment in the collider that we're actually doing only contains two particles. And that's why we are only dotting this external state with this particular state. Yes? The subscript in the coefficient. Oh, here. Oh, I didn't want to write everything, so I just wrote final and initial. Well, it depends. It's a coefficient that depends on this, and this coefficient depends on this. It's just like what I did uh, when I expanded the basis. In fact, the alpha here should have a label that depends on the state psi, right? If I really want to keep all labels correctly there. Yes. OK. What does it mean to have a linear combination of one particle state state with a three particle state? Some of both 
that's a, I mean, that's a good question. Yes, sorry, just, just a second. But in fact, these are just, all of them are just states in our Hilbert space, okay? So that is a completely fine, uh, I know it sounds a little bit strange because in quantum mechanics, in the standard quantum mechanics that you, you have seen, you always have a, fi a fixed set of particles, right? But precisely, one of the things we have learned from the experiments, right, is that we can, pre we can produce, from the same two particles coming in, we can produce a variety of final particles. So we are forced to introduce a Hilbert space that contains all these states together. We have to treat them all together, okay? Yes. Yeah, that's, some books will tell you that you are considering two different Hilbert spaces. But the way I'm telling you is that there is only one Hilbert space that describes nature, and it has a basis of in states and a basis of outgoing, uh, outgoing states. No, this is a different basis. I'm calling them out, okay? It's a completely different basis. In fact, now we're going to answer that question. So if these two are different bases, okay? I mean, to be strictly formal, and which is something we're gonna do when we do the quantum field theory course, right? These are states that have the profile of particles in the infinite future with this given momentum. And this is a state that has a profile of particles in the infinite past that have this momentum. Okay, we really have to work hard to make this very, very precise. Okay, but for the time being, I want to be, I don't want to be that precise and simply say, well, we have these two bases of objects if they are bases, we look at our quantum mechanics review and say, well, there must be an operator that maps one basis to the other, okay? So there must, it, there must exist an operator, I'm going to call it S for the scattering, that does the following. It takes our state, or maps one basis to another basis. So using this, this quantity must then be the matrix elements of this operator in any of the two bases. So I choose them to be the in bases. So the relevant physical object would be the matrix elements of this quantity in one of the two bases. Okay, very good. So let's see. Okay. We're almost there to actually, to actually tell you what D is. So that's where I want to finish the lecture. I want to tell you exactly what D is in terms of this. So remember, our Hilbert space is a huge monster, right? So in fact, the Hilbert space not only is infinite dimensional, right? The space is not even countable, right? Because it has states for different momentum, and the momentum can take continuous values. So we have this incredibly large space. The S operator is an operator that acts on that space. So Using the name matrix is a little bit of a stretch, right? But if you think that you, can, that you could, in the finite dimensional case, we could arrange the vectors in a countable set, right? And then define a matrix as the, ent uh, as the, as the contraction of our operator with different entries, with different bases, right? And define matrix elements and build a matrix, right? So we want to borrow that language and say that these physical objects are the entries of a matrix, okay? 
So is that, was that your question? Oh, no, this is one entry. I mean, this is one entry of the metrics. So, oh, so, so look, at the, look at the vector space, right? At the Hilbert space. Think about each of those vectors as one entry. Of course, we cannot label them as one, two, three, four, right? Because they are uncountable. But we should think if we could do that, each one of those guys could be one of these psi's, okay, psi i. So you should think about this as a contraction, as the matrix elements of S dotted with some state psi i and some state psi j. It happens that this state psi j is this one. It so happens to be this one. And this one happens, this one happens to be this one. Okay? But they are all states in the Hilbert space. Okay? They should be treated in the same footing. Yes? No, this one's, this is the same. Yes. Yeah, I'm defining the operator in this way. Yes. Okay, so we're almost done. All we need is to realize that that object that's given has pieces that we are not interested in. So the S operator So what's the best way to say this? Um, so what do you think we should use for an operator that tells you that no scattering happened? So the incoming particles just miss each other and just fly by. Should be the identity, right? Very good. So if we are interested in a scattering, we should really subtract from here the case when nothing happens. That's the identity. In fact, if you put this, if you put the identity here, in this particular case, we will get zero, because these two states are, ortho are orthogonal, okay? So if you put the identity, it doesn't matter if we put it or not here, if we subtract the identity, because this will give you zero in this particular example, right? Yes? Um, you know, just something with respect to that. So you're defining your, your states to be orthogonal if they have a different number of particles. Different Even different moment, yes. Yes. Sorry, how do we know they're orthogonal? Because I'm choosing my final states. I know what I want to, to see, right? They are different. By assumption, they are orthogonal. Because they are bases. They are orthonormal bases. Okay? But Pretty good. That's a different set. Okay. That's a different basis, and that's a different basis. So why would... <laughs> yes. Okay, so I'm going to give a name to this operator. It's called IT. People put the I just by convention, so this is convention. Okay. And then say that we are interested in are the matrix elements of T. Okay. I'm going to drop the in in, assuming that we know what we mean. Now, this object, okay, this object must know that if we scatter or if we try to scatter states that to the total momentum doesn't agree, we should get zero. So this matrix element somehow should know that there is a delta function imposing momentum conservation. And whatever else is left here 
is usually called m and it's called the invariant matrix element. of the process PA, PB going to P1, Pn. And now we are ready to finish the lecture because it turns out that the object we need in order to describe our differential cross-section cannot believe it. Did I erase it? Yes, I did. That's really bad. Well, at least I, kept, I, at least I defined what I wanted. Our D happens to be the mod square of this P, of this M. Okay. So, if you found many things in the lecture confusing or unclear, that was the purpose. <laughs> <laughs> In fact, given the nature of the course that is very fast paced, many people will come and, and tell you about different subjects, very interesting subjects, sometimes at the cutting edge of research. And by, a, by, by nature, many things will be unclear. And it's your job to try and fill the gaps. Okay? In this case, these four lectures are just, as I told you, a warm up for what is coming. We will have a quantum field theory course, and there we're going to try to make sense out of all these things that we said today. What we want to do in the next three lectures is to push unitarity to the limits and see how far we can get in learning what this object is just by using unitarity. Yes? T doesn't satisfy any 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 property that has a name, right? But very good. So for tomorrow, work out what unitarity for S means in terms of T. It will give you an equation, OK? It doesn't have a name, not that I know. So work it out, OK? Very good. So we'll stop here.